Welcome back to the channel. We are just about down to the final major bodywork repair on this project, and that is the driver's side rear corner. As with all the other repairs on this channel, I've been as meticulous as possible with the rust removal to ensure that I have a restoration that I could enjoy for years to come. And I'll be sharing that process with you guys in detail. So if you're interested in that, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. But for now, let's get right into the work. If you've been keeping up with the series, you know that I removed the old captive nut that mounts the rear bumper because it was completely rusted out. I'll be replacing it with this one. Now to get everything lined up, I'll be using this template that I made a few episodes ago. This step would not normally be necessary as you could just use your bumper bracket mount in order to keep your spacing correct. But unfortunately, I don't have a rear bumper nor bumper bracket mounts. I will be purchasing them in the future in order to have that classic stock look. Also, it's probably not a good idea to be driving around without a rear bumper, but I had to make do with what I had, so I made this little bracket. And once I was sure that my spacing was correct, it was time to work on the captive nut mount. It is typically spot welded on from the bottom. It's actually a part of the D pillar that's spot welded on from the bottom, but I'll be spot welding it on from the top because I don't like getting hot slag in the face. After thoroughly removing the rust from the inner D pillar, I sanded it down and cleaned it up in order to prepare it for the zinc weld through primer. Now do not forget to use this stuff between any metal that you're going to be welding together. It's going to keep it from rusting or at least prevent it from rusting for a lot longer than it would without it. Personally, I like to remove the primer right where my electrode is going to touch, as you can see right here. But once that was all ready, it was time to weld. Now I left one full weld in there in real time speed, so you can see how long I'm holding. This is in order to ensure that I have the maximum penetration possible and good adhesion, because this is a part that's going to be holding on the rear bumper. Or at least when I'm bolting it on, it's going to want to rotate, so I don't want this moving anywhere. And I'm using it on the third highest setting on my welder. I've only got A, B, C, and D. All welders are different, but if you're working on restoring your vehicle, eventually you're going to figure out your welder and build a good relationship with it. I'm once again preparing the inside of the D-pillar for a little bit more of that zinc weld through primer. And it's also time to prepare the outer part of the D-pillar, which as you can see is a bit dirty. So I sanded it down, used some wax and grease remover, and boy, is it looking 10 times as good. And let's give this some zinc weld through primer as well. Now it did take a little bit of pushing and bending and hammering, but that's pretty much any replacement piece you're gonna use. That's just a part of the game. You really gotta have your tools ready and at hand. Most of the time when I'm welding something, it will take some persuasion from the hammer and dolly and having as many clamps as possible will make your life so much easier. I think at this point, the one tool I have the most of in my garage is clamps. And I've had a few people in the comments section ask me about this tool. It's a finger sander or a mini belt sander. I got it from Harbor Freight and I could not live without it. Once the deep pillar was nice and finished up, we can move on to the part that you probably came here for, which is fitting on that rear corner. But before we get into that, I'd like to thank Heritage Parts Center for providing the parts used in this episode. I've used Heritage Parts Center a couple times in the past before they reached out to me to sponsor the channel. And that's due to their large selection of parts and their easy to navigate website. Just a few clicks and you can find any part that you're looking for, anywhere from engine transmission parts to body panels, which is the main thing that I've been focusing on lately. And as you'll see in this episode, the parts that I'm using fit perfectly and are of high quality. Thank you Heritage Parts Center for sponsoring the Vangabonders. If you'd like 10% off your next order, make sure to use code VANGABONDERS10 at checkout. Not only will you be getting 10% off, but you'll be helping to support this channel. Now let's get back to the video. When doing a replacement patch like this, I've found that there's no real way to measure, at least there's no way that I know how to measure, in order to transcribe it onto my replacement part. So I like to place it where it's going to go and then little by little cut and grind until I get it relatively close. As you can see here, I'm going to be using the old tail light housing to make sure that everything is well fitting where it's supposed to go. But in the end of the day, I want it to look as straight as possible. That's why I'm using this level here at the seam. The seams are where all the magic happens. If you have scenes that look wonky, then your fitment's not going to look good. Using this level with a little piece of metal, I was able to get things to line up so that I could make this final cut in my replacement panel. 
It's a lot of trial and error and it takes a little bit of time, but it ends up coming out as close to perfect as I think is possible. Now I won't be welding on this rear fender piece here on this episode as I still need to fix the rust that's on the inner portions of the wheel well, but I like to make sure that I get both sides of my repair mocked up before I decide to weld anything in. That way I'm not faced with any surprises later on. Might as well go into a little bit more detail how I'm doing this. I kept the seam all the way down to here. So what I do is line it up here and I'm gonna do a mark here just using a flathead and then I'll cut off this part of the lip. That's gonna allow it to lay flat and then I could mark on the inside. I did a lot of backsplashes back in the day and I think that's where I've developed this technique of not measuring as much but putting it in place and marking it as you end up getting a better fit. At least personally, maybe I'm just bad at measuring. We got this clamped up just about where it's gonna go. I'm gonna get inside of there, mark the inside. I'll be able to get it pretty close. Now a heads up, the tracing technique will only work if you're able to lay your replacement patch as flat as possible on the metal. If not, it's going to give you some weird results. I had a commenter on my last episode point out that the mud flap was not bent to the correct angle. And they're correct, but that's nothing that a 2x4 and a little bit of elbow grease couldn't fix. Oh, it's gonna be so wonderful. If you're familiar with this channel, you already know what time it oh. is. It's Aircraft Stripper Ultra Time. Now, I love using this stuff to get the transport primer off. It's a lot easier than using a carbide disc, and it does quick work of it. Please don't be like me and use gloves. Uh, I don't know why I didn't just grab my gloves, but it was definitely a bad idea. As you can see, the paint comes off like butter, and, and there's something satisfying about seeing the transport primer just wipe right off, and uh, that's why you don't want to paint over this stuff. You rinse it off with water because you don't want to leave any of that chemical behind, and no, I'm not letting this flow into my garden. Why would I ever let this flow into my garden? And then I let it dry for a little bit, and while that's drying, there is something else we need to work on. And it's these two holes that were cut into the rear fender here, where it previously had an AC line going through it. Now instead of squaring out these holes, I opted to make a round patch because you can't make a square smiley face. I cut it roughly into the shape and then using a flappy disc of about 80 grit, I just grind it into a circle. It evaporates. Oh, oops. Now, if you're enjoying the content so far, don't forget to leave a comment down below as it is the easiest way to help out the channel and subscribe to the channel. I'd also like to thank all my latest subscribers who have joined the Vangabonders lately. I'm so grateful the channel is growing and it's thanks to all of you. Hit that like button down below and I hope you continue to enjoy this video. Try that again. Oh yeah. A little bit of hammer, a little bit of dolly. You should be good. Instead of pre-curving my little circular patch pieces here, I opted for welding them in and little by little hammering it so that it would get the correct curvature of that inner wheel well. I found this to be a lot easier than trying to curve that little piece the way it needed to be. But now it's time to prepare for that battery tray.
I've explained this process a couple of times, but for those of you that are new to the channel, I'll explain it to you guys again. So once the paint is stripped off, I like to sand down my replacement panel with some 40 or 60 grit sandpaper. This is to prepare it for the epoxy primer that's going to be sprayed on it. Now this can be done once the part is installed, but I find it to be a lot easier to get this step done while it's out of the vehicle. Do it. When I did my rear corner replacement on the passenger side of the bus, I did so without installing the battery tray first. I wanted to try something a little bit different on this side, so I went ahead and welded in the battery tray before doing the rear corner. Now I don't know if this is any easier, uh, especially due to the fact that I have not installed the battery tray in the other side, but it didn't seem to be a bother installing the battery tray beforehand. It actually seemed to hold things in place a little bit better. Once I was sure that all my seams were lining up exactly how I wanted to, I laid my first tack. Now this is always the scariest part of doing these kinds of replacements is that first tack. But once you get that first one in and you see that things are starting to look good, it just gets easier and easier and it just gets more fun as you go along. Now remember to always take your time when doing these kind of body panel welding as the heat created from the welding is likely to warp your panel and we're trying to do these repairs using as little bit of Bondo as possible. So the less heat you can generate the better. Some people like to blow off their tack welds with uh, compressed air. Some people like to wipe it down with a wet rag. I just like to take my time and I skip my welds around very far apart to allow the metal to cool down as I go. Same thing goes for grinding. You don't want to grind too much too quickly. If you're starting to change the color of the metal as you're grinding, you're definitely heating it up too much and you're going to cause it to warp. So the key here is to take your time, have fun, meditate and weld away. And in the end, hopefully you have a repair that looks like this. That seam is perfect. The entire repair looks stock and fresh, and I think it's going to require very minimal filler. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So if you are interested in this kind of content, don't forget to leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and I will see you in the next one.